Good evening. I'm Philip Booth, Director of Catholic Mission and Professor of Finance, Public Policy and Ethics at St. Mary's University. Welcome to the fourth in our series of four events, The Common Good, What Does It Mean for Families, Civil Society and Government? The common good is defined in Catholic social teaching as the sum of those conditions of the social life whereby men, families and associations more adequately and readily uh, may attain their own perfection. In practical terms, together for the common good, like to express this as relating to the shared life of a society. It's not a utopian ideal um, imposed from above, um, and it doesn't involve the dominance of one group over another, but rather upholds diversity of opinion in order to deliberate and come to a settled pluralism of identities and interests. Now, two things are worth noting about this definition and practical expression. The first is that the common good is about something that is both common and also good. So you have to have some kind of conception of what is good and an understanding of the good. The second is that if we left the pursuit of the common good to the government alone, then society would become insufferable and would certainly not reflect what is intended by the phrase. And it's for that reason that uh, this is the final in a series of four um, events. The first explored the meaning of the term, the second what it means for the family, the third what it means for society and local institutions, and we finish tonight by looking at what the common good means for government. Because the Catholic Church and other denominations in different ways have always emphasised that the promotion of the common good is the responsibility of each and every individual family uh, and organisation within society. The series is, is organised by Together for the Common Good and St Mary's University in association with the Centre for Social Justice and Caritas Social Action Network. Um, and perhaps in relation to this topic, I, I could just notice that I could just um, uh, note that St Mary's University has what I think is probably a unique uh, master's program in Catholic social teaching. There are some leaflets about that around, and further details uh, can be found on our website. We are delighted that the series is sponsored by CCLA, one of the UK's largest ethical fund managers and home of the new Catholic Investment Fund. Um, finally, some practical points for those of you who like to organise your thoughts in 280 characters. The Twitter hashtag for tonight is uh, hashtag common good government. Uh, we'll finish around 8.15 or perhaps a little before and then there will be uh, drinks afterwards. So I'm delighted now to hand over to our chair for the evening, Ruth Kelly. Most of you will know Ruth um, as a former MP and senior government minister. Um, she is now a non-executive board member of the Council for the Economy at the Vatican and also a visiting professor at St Mary's University. Thank you, Ruth. Well, thank you very much, Philip, and it's a real pleasure for me to be with you all here in person uh, tonight. Um, absolutely brilliant to get to see uh, the faces here, although I know that there'll still be many people watching the recording in future too. Now, it's been said that we are not entering an era of change, but a change of era. We see symptoms of the old order collapsing across the West, and politics in our own country changing before our very eyes. In this new era, the forging of renewed uh, settlement for the common good is the great task of our time. It's the responsibility not only of politicians, but of all of us working together as individuals, as families, as local and regional institutions. So tonight we're going to specifically be looking at the role of government and at the statecraft involved in building this new settlement at this particular moment in our history. Now, the levelling up agenda clearly gives us one possible space into which uh, we can start this process of change. And what better place we have uh, to discuss this topic than here at the Church of St Mary's Putney, where 374 years ago, 
In 1647, our forebears were holding discussions, the Putney debates, about the makeup of a new constitution for Britain. Now, in our time, the role of government is fiercely contested. We hear many that are arguing that there needs to be a much bigger role for the state post-pandemic, that the NHS, that our social services need to be much more resilient uh, to cope with future shocks. Some argue for a strong centralised state that guides the economy but explicitly supports civil society and the family. Others make the case for a decentralised model rooted in the renewal of place and places and in the revitalising of local and regional institutions. And others believe that it is only a much more hands-off approach that will really allow civil society uh, the freedom and resources to flourish. So as our country faces many complex challenges ahead, we're really fortunate to have with us tonight an absolutely exceptional panel who are going to help us explore what the common good means uh, for government in practical terms. So let me introduce our speakers. I'm absolutely delighted uh, here on my left, on my far left, in fact, first of all, to welcome uh, Lord Glassman. Um, Maurice um, Glassman is a Labour life peer, political theorist and thinker on political economy. He's a community organiser and writer. He's founder of Blue Labour and director of the Common Good Foundation. So welcome tonight, uh, Maurice. Then we have Caroline here on my, on my left, Caroline Slowcock, who's a founding member of A Better Way and co-convener, co uh, the founder and director of Civil Exchange, a member of the Early Action Task Force and a former senior civil servant. So welcome tonight, uh, Caroline. And then on my right, we have Imogen, Imogen Sinclair. Now, Imogen is, we're extraordinarily lucky to have Imogen tonight. And it's very fortuitous that we have you because unfortunately Danny, and I can relate to this extremely well, was only told last night by the whips that he wasn't going to be given a slip for this evening and has to vote in Parliament. So Imogen has brilliantly said that she would step up to the plate and debate uh, the common good with us here on Danny's behalf. Um, Imogen in her own right has uh, quite an impressive CV. She's director of the Social Covenant Unit, which was established in 2021, that's this year, by Miriam Cates MP and by Danny Kruger MP. Uh, the, national, the, the Social Covenant Unit exists to promote ideas and policy suggestions that strengthen families, communities and the nation. And Imogen has had several years experience uh, working in Parliament and is the author of Community Capital uh, for the Centre for Social Justice. She holds a master's with distinction in philosophy, completed under the supervision of the late uh, Professor Roger Scruton. So, Imogen, we're doubly delighted uh, to have you here this evening. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. So, let me now just say a few words about the format for this evening. So, the way that this is going to work is that we're going to hear a short contributions from each of the speakers, about five minutes each. Then I'm going to lead a conversation with, with the panel. Um, and then that's going to be followed by a Q&A, uh, taking questions from uh, the floor, in which I'm hoping that you'll be sitting there listening to the debate and, and thinking about what questions to ask. So now I'm going to turn to Morris uh, to kick off the debate this evening. Thanks, Ruth. And uh, good evening, everybody. And let me know if you, if you can't hear me. Um, it, it's really wonderful to be here. Um, just to say something about being here is, is that the politics that I have, it, it takes an equal inspiration from, from Rainsborough and the Levellers and the Diggers as from Archbishop Lord. I think Blue Labour's kind of unique Ruth in this regard. It's taking inspiration from those, from the, from the Levellers, the idea of the common inheritance of the earth and, and of democracy and um, and from Archbishop Lord, it's just to recognize his resistance to enclosures and the dispossession of the poor. But just to say, it's a funny thing to say. So I feel on, uh, you know, it's double holy ground, if you like. It's a, it's a church and it's also a seedbed um, for very unique developments that went on um, in England, um, certainly that didn't die, that endured um, over, over all these years. And I guess it's, 
it's very easy for me to say as a Jew that it would be a heresy to, um, to Rainsborough, certainly, but uh, the, just to express my gratitude also for the inheritance of Catholic social thought, which has definitely um, framed the way that I see the world and is an inexhaustible inspiration. I mean, the quote that Ruth gave is actually from Pope Francis, that we're not living through an era of change, but a change of era. Um, when I read that in 2019, it made a huge amount of, of sense to me. And it's tried to discern um, what those changes are in relation to, to politics. I mean, we've all lived through it. We've lived through the, the, the shocks of the Brexit referendum. We then lived through that interregnum period where it, it was, everything was blocked and extremely confused. And, and then we lived through the 2019 general election where there was a very serious class realignment. The changes are all around us. I would say, Ruth, that it precedes COVID. You know, the, the COVID intensified some things. Um, but the change of era was, as Pope Francis said, was already upon us. And we're moving away from the ideas that framed the previous 40 to 50 years of politics, which was about summarized sometimes as globalization, which meant that there was nothing that you could do about technological change, that it passed over borders, that, the, that there was inevi an inevitable teleology towards the removal of borders, to the, particularly the domination of what I would call capital, that capital was a dominant force that would be the driver of change, and therefore far less attention played to to the very, very basis of what I consider Catholic social thought to be. So first of all, place, understood in terms of subsidiarity. So there was a degradation of place. There, there was also a degradation of labor. The labor was just considered a fungible factor moving in, moving in and out. But there was a breakdown of solidarity um, and, and, and the stewardship of, of nature. So, I haven't got much time, so I'm going to just say, what are the fundamental features of this new era? And the first is, um, is, is that there's a far more important role for the nation state in relation to government in the economy. So we can talk about the health service, we can talk about education, but the really big change um, is that the state plays a large role in the organization of the economy. The second political change, which wasn't really expected, um, was that the working class are the decisive force in politics. For many years, and I lived through it um, quite intensely, working class were a remnant of a previous civilization. They were obsolete, they were left behind, uh, they had no constructive role to play in a common good, but now, now they do, and they were the decisive force in both the Brexit referendum and in the last general election. And the last feature is the return of the places that they live in as the contested site of politics, sometimes referred to as the Red Wall. Um, there's various ways of talking about it, but that's where the contest, so three things that were previously considered nostalgic, idiotic, ridiculous, um, populist, whatever words were used, are now inescapably central to the political terrain. And that's the role of the nation state in the economy, um, the status of work and, and workers, and the places um, that they live. Um, so, so the way that I've tried to conceptualize this is to say that we're moving from an era of contract to an era of covenant that there's got to be some binding, some binding of capital to the common good, some resistance to its domination um, of, the, of the economy, and that um, the state is an essential instrument to do that, but the danger is that the state will be an ally in the degradation and further dismantling of what's already weak, which is society. So the general analysis is, the state is powerful, the market is powerful, but society is not. And how do you, how do you renew that? Um, so in terms of developing those ideas in relation to, to government and, and the common good, um, 
we're going to be posed with this now very directly with this new ministry, this levelling up housing and community. Um, and it can go two ways. It can go into a, a centralised Keynesian project infrastructure mode. Um, and, and I think that would be terribly mistaken. Or it could begin, if it based itself, as I say, around Catholic social thought, would look at the participation of people in those places. That would look to a genuine uh, renewal um, of community that it would look to building not housing stock, but begin to conceptualize how to build uh, communities and how to build places that people actually want to live in. And, and then in terms of the economy, it would look to endowment. So the feature of the previous 40 years, and I guess Ruth, I'm going to have to end with this. Is this right? Yeah. It's amazing, narcissistic. When you're talking, you don't really think it's taking any time. You know, this is the problem I often confront at, at home and away. Um, I, I was just getting going there. But the, but the fundamental thing to say is, is, is that in the previous 40 to 50 years, what you had was an enormous centralization and concentration of capital. We learned that in the economic crash of 2008, that the regions were depleted of their building societies, of banks, of assets, that all the capital had moved down to the city and then was quite extravagantly blown. Um, I won't dwell on that, but there's been an enormous concentration of capital and an enormous concentration of political power in Westminster. So there has to be um, endowments of regional banks local vocational colleges that can elevate the status um, of labor um, and the activation it's great that, that benedict is here from grimsby this is where we're we're looking at these things he's the catholic chaplain um, in grimsby setting up a commun community organization in grimsby and trying to ascertain what it would be required to create the kingdom again some notion of relationships and notion of community power so those are the key things ahead with government is it going to be done to people or are people going to genuinely participate in this in relation to the common good how do you build a relationship between place capital labor and i think it's done through an institutional settlement a new economic settlement that does not consider human beings and nature as commodities but creates institutions through which their status is elevated. So, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for some um, incredibly thought-provoking comments, Morris. And I'm sure we'll hear this idea of covenant uh, arise, not just from this side of the table, but also uh, more broadly as we go through the evening. Um, I'm going to turn now to, to Caroline, and if you would... Well, that would be great, thanks. Well, thank you. It's a, it's, um, it's a pleasure to be here. Now, can, let me know if you can't hear me. I just want to make sure that uh, you can. Excellent. Well, I've got many hats, but I'm going to wear one particular hat in my remarks now, which is as co-convener of, of a network which is called A Better Way. And as many of you won't know anything about it, I just want to explain what it is. It is a network of people from different sectors, public um, voluntary and some private. Um, people who are working at the grassroots, people are working at local authority level, people are working nationally, and people right across um, England and indeed um, the UK um, from lots of different types of places. And this network has come together to um, improve services, build community and create a fairer society. And the way we work is that we spend a lot of time sharing insights and practices with each other. And we've come up with a set of principles and also a set of behaviors which have come through that very um, intensive process. And um, those principles and behaviors are relevant to all of us, uh, but they're also relevant to governments. So I'm going to focus in on those. But our kind of ultimate objective is um, what somebody uh, in one of our annual gatherings just described as building a bigger we. And I think it's, it's very similar to the common good 
actually. It's a society where everyone has a say, communities look out for each other, and society values and invests in everyone. And I think the government has a, has a big role here to make things happen. I've got three things that I'm going to say. I'm going to restrict myself to three things. The first is that government should decentralise. It is too centralised. Um, according to the principles of subsidiarity, a word I cannot say uh, without stumbling, I'm afraid. It should invest, especially in social infrastructure, and it needs to change the way it works. We need a new operating model for government. It's not just what you do, it's how you do it as well. And um, I think there are clear messages for government in our principles. These, I'll just br briefly run through them. Um, in no particular order. The first is local is better than national. It's not to say there isn't a role for national government, but local is better. And mass participation is better than centralised power. It, relationships are better than transactions. Building on strengths is better than focusing on weaknesses. Prevention is better than cure. And collaboration is better than competition. And principles are better than targets. The last one is changing ourselves is better than demanding change from others. And I think that's just as true for government uh, as it is for us. And just to go through some of those, those three points briefly, decentralizing, but using the principle of subsidiarity. If you take something like global warming, it's clear that you know, we cannot form international treaties at community level. Um, you know, we cannot regulate, we cannot put down laws, we cannot put in subsidies. But there are many things that we can do, both as individuals and in communities, to reduce our carbon footprint. So there's a, an appropriate role for everybody. But the default switch of government, and we've seen it uh, all too um, clearly, I think, in COVID-19, is to centralise, especially in a crisis. So we've seen a wasteful test and trace system when there were actually very good facilities at, at local level. We've seen an NHS volunteer scheme, which lots of people signed up to, but it wasn't half as good as what was going on at community level uh, to mobilize. And um, I think what the government needs to do is it needs, it needs to have, we need to have public services, we need to have laws and, and so forth. But ultimately it needs to invest. Only it can raise national taxes and it needs to put those to fair use. And that takes me to my second point, which is to invest in social infrastructure, essentially in a good place. And my definition of social infrastructure is very broad. It includes activities, services, facilities. It, it, it's, and every sector plays a role in this, not just the public sector, the voluntary sector, obviously, the community sector, but also the, the private sector, you know, the, the shops, the pubs, the cafes are all part of what makes a good place. And the important thing I think for government to do is not just to invest, raise money, but it also must let the people decide what they want, not tell them what they want, and give the money to them. And the levelling up fund is a worked example in how not to do this. You know, it's centrally run. It doesn't give control to local people. Um, and actually, it's probably not enough money. Um, but I want to turn finally to the behaviours of a better way. You know, we've identified four things that all of us can do, but I think government can do, and they are the essence of this new operating style. First of all, putting relationships first, because people cannot thrive um, without good relationships. And that means building good relationships and services, but also in how government works with others, building trust. It's about sharing and building power because power is held in too few hands in this country. And that means giving it away, giving money and say to people, particularly at community level. It's about listening to each other to find out what works and to discover what will. And that means particularly listening to those who are least heard. And it's about joining forces across society, including with civil society at national level, um, to work together to tackle the big challenges we face because government can't do it alone. So what I'm arguing for, to conclude, is collaborative government. This is um, government that's giving power and agency to others. But it is also a government that is not telling others what they need, or what to do, or how to live their lives. Thank you. Thank you.
thank you very much for those comments, uh, Caroline. Um, if I could turn now to Imogen, if you want to make a few comments. Thanks, Ruth. Can you all hear me? I can hear my voice echoing. Fantastic. Um, I, it's really, I'm really delighted uh, to be here in place of Danny, and I will all want to also extend his apologies. Uh, the whips are, are keeping him locked up in, in the Commons. Um, but I will, I will be brief so we can get on to the um, debate. I don't know if anyone noticed in the Chancellor's budget, what, what was it, two weeks ago now, he used the phrase common goods, not quite common good, but he used the phrase common goods. It's very useful when you have um, on your computer alerts which tell you when you know, all this interesting rhetoric and language is being used. Um, but he did. He, used, he spoke of common goods and rather uninspiringly he was referring to public services. But interesting, I thought, that he should be citing uh, depending on Catholic social teaching. I think we may have his A's to thank for that, but no doubt I thought it was notable. Um, common goods are a different thing to the common good. Um, but this is where we need to get to, from the particular to the universal. But I don't think the particular is a bad place to start. The family, the community, and the nation, these are the fundamental tiers of association that make us happy, safe, and free. We, as human beings, are at our best when we exercise the virtue, something that Edward Skidelsky calls the excellences of the species. Humans, we are uniquely good at care. We're uniquely good at creativity. And what makes these associ associations common and inclusive and accessible is not some kind of magic um, of government, nor is it individual self-determination. Indeed, we are born into these relationships. These associations precede and succeed us. They are always already there. Um, we can't take them to the grave. In that sense, they are not assets. We did not design them, and we can never own them. They are, in a sense, sacred. So what does this mean for government? Well. The new social covenant unit, uh, which is a, a pressure group, I, I suppose, that um, we founded um, seven or eight months ago now, um, we think that what this means for government is as follows. The state cannot fix everything. It can't make people good. It can't make people happy. It can't make people safe all the time. But nor can the individual alone. And I think we all agree here that individuals deserve to be recognized and respected by others. And this tells us that we are creatures who depend on connection. So rather than new legislation or more rights that try to protect this bit or that bit of the individual, we need to look to the commitments that we hold most dear. And I think that they are the family, the community, and the nation. These are goods that are common to all of us. And granted, though these things um, at time may be weak, they might break or come under threat. They're there and they're real, and I think we all know what they are and what they mean to us. They're alive and they're present to us every day. And so my day job really is um, calling not for a new social contract. You can see there's a lot of agreement, I think, on this table already. Um, between the lonely individual and the bureaucratic state, we're calling for a new social covenant, so a strengthening of the bonds that can make us safe and happy and free and that make us more free to be human, so that's to be caring and to be creative and to practice the great virtues and to be better people as well. So this, I believe, is the proper pursuit of government. Um, that's a commitment to support the associations that make us safe, make us happy, make us free. And this, I also believe, is the proper purpose of politics, to make stronger families, stronger communities, and a stronger nation. And this is what I like to call the politics of the covenant. And I think this is the new settlement that we must usher in. Thank you very much, Imogen. And you know, I sat and I watched the entirety of the budget speech and didn't notice the words common and good, goods um, being linked. I definitely.
definitely need alerts on my computer. And I'm going to just kick off a bit of a debate between uh, the panel now. So do pick up on each other's points. There's obviously a huge amount of agreement on the panel about the importance of uh, relationships and of social infrastructure. Um, but Imogen, if you don't mind, I'm going to start by asking you about how Rishi Sunak talked about the common goods, as you mentioned it, in his budget, um, and the implication that what's really needed a strong state-sponsored public services. And I'd be interested in what the other panellists have to say on that in a moment. Is that an important part of the new settlements, do you think? Or do you think this is a government that hasn't yet understood the concept of grassroots civic participation and delivery? Thanks, Ruth. I think I've got all of that. I've, I have written down some other quotes from Rishi, which I thought were interesting. So he said, I'll just start and, and then we'll get to your question. Uh, he said, there's a reason we talk about the importance of family, community and personal responsibility, not because these are an alternative to the market or the state, it's because they are more important than the market or the state. And he, um, he went on to say, we are bound together by more than transactional benefits. So I think there's, I think there's reason, there is reason to be hopeful. Um, you asked about social infrastructure and I think, um, I think um, Caroline, Caroline mentioned um, kind of it's important to, to to define our terms. Um, and I, like Karen, I think, believe that these are the, the gathering places where people can come together and we can foster that, that kind of community power. Um, and in terms of um, public services, Ruth, that you mentioned, um, I think often there is a tendency um, for people to see um, civil society volunteers as this great resource and this great asset that can um, serve public services and run public services. And indeed, I think that's where we, um, the Conservatives, fell into trouble with the big society. It was seen as, oh, well, government's going to um, just invite all these volunteers to serve you know, run public services and we're just going to step back and save a bunch of money. Um, and in a report called Trusting the People, which the new Social Covenant Unit launched at party conference a few weeks ago, we, we try and tackle this problem head on and we say, no, the government absolutely has a role to play in the, in the delivery of our public services, obviously, with communities, um, with local people. And so what I'd like to see is, for instance, in terms of welfare delivery, I mean, I just think for, I used to work at the Centre for Social Justice and when I was doing some, some research there, the way that some of our most vulnerable and disadvantaged people um, were treated by welfare delivery, by DWP, um, was um, a great shame, frankly. And if we can see a more, a more hyper-local hyper delivery of, of welfare, I think that would, be, that would be fantastic and that in a sense would be would be sort of what I'm talking about in terms of um, government um, and people working together to, to deliver the, the public services, the welfare that we need. Th thank you very much. And, and Caroline, this sort of touches right into the, sort of the comments that you were making about how to deliver public services and participation with people. Can you say a little bit more about the social infrastructure side uh, that you would need to see developed in, uh, in your model? Yeah. Um, can I just say, though, because I've worked in government for many years and um, um, since 1982 and worked directly with Margaret Thatcher at one point as a civil servant. And um, over my career, uh, at the probably a sort of critical turning point, it was another era uh, beginning, um, government started to see itself as essentially having quite a managerial role in relation to public services, you know, delivering efficiency. Um, and effectiveness, value for money for the taxpayer, and um, really sort of failed to see, it's almost like a kind of blind spot in their vision, the importance of social infrastructure. And um, so the whole thing about place has, um, you know, escaped their notice, I think, over, you know, successive governments, if I may say so. And um, I think it's very important um, to recognize that, uh, Good is created in society, not just through public services, but are often quite remedial. You know, they step in when things go wrong in our lives. Not always, obviously, education is different. Uh, but actually, if you have a good place uh, with the things which people value, 
um, then often the, the, you know, the, the social capital is um, the connections that people have uh, enable them not just to thrive, but if things start going wrong in their lives, to be able to fall back on other people to help them and therefore not get into such a difficult situation. And social infrastructure, to my mind, and I've, I've written reports about it with another hat on for the Early Action Task Force, has to be um, you know, quite wide-ranging. One has to understand it um, as all of the things which really matter in a place. It includes public services, uh, ideally public services which are sort of well-situated in the community and work with the community. But it also includes the parks and spaces, you know, the activities from choirs and football clubs to... Um, you know, uh, yoga classes, uh, and it, all the facilities, you know, from broadband, which is obviously tremendously important in helping people to connect with each other and work, um, to coffee shops and pubs and restaurants. We all know what a good place is, because we choose to live in it if we have enough money in our lives to be able to do that. And a lot of people have seen a lot of those things disappear in a sort of vicious cycle of disinvestment, first by the government and then by uh, businesses. Um, to, you know, so they've seen their places evaporate. And I, I think you know, government doesn't understand the importance of social infrastructure. I think it's beginning to talk about it. And that's, a, that's an excellent step forward. So j just if I could just um, be a little bit provocative. In your opening comments, you, you actually mentioned the importance of national taxation and raising money to fund services. Yes. If you're so keen on decentralising and devolving local services, does the same not apply to taxes and raising taxes locally? Well, I, I mean, you know, I'm not speaking for a better way here because it hasn't thought through this level of detail, but just um, speaking as a sort of person, you know, with my think tank hat on. I do think there's a role for um, putting uh, more revenue raising into local hands. We already have it through, the, uh, you know, through, through business rates and, and council tax. Um, so it's not a novel concept. But I think there is scope to increase that, and that's already happening to a degree in Scotland. Um, but, but the government will always have a role in raising taxes, taxes and it is, is responsibility and borrowing, and it is its responsibility to spend that money well. And I would say that in, in investing in social infrastructure is an investment with enormous social returns, uh, and one that has been ignored by government. You know, it will help grow GDP, it will help grow well-being and happiness. You know, people, com people and communities will thrive and prosper, and um, the returns are difficult to quantify, but they're incredibly important. So I would say that the government should be borrowing. This is a form of capital, social capital, that's being created, just like uh, physical capital, you know, roads and bridges. And I think the government should be borrowing. I think it should be spending a lot more, but it be, should be putting that money, it should be seeding local endowment funds. I'm with Morris on this, you know, and I've written about this myself. Um, it should be seeding local endowment funds, uh, which can bring in money from the local community as well. People may contribute to it. People from the financial diaspora you know, may want to contribute to communities that they've grown up in. And, and you can create funds which are locally controlled, which build places for now and for the future. So, so Maurice, do you share this emphasis? You share the emphasis on place, clearly. Um, where do you think social infrastructure fits into uh, the government's view of public services and how it should be spending its money? Sure. So, so just to say that when I hear... It's not that when I hear the word social infrastructure, I reach for my revolver. It's just that I... You know, what are we talking about when we say social infrastructure? Um, Hayek, uh, a thinker I've engaged with for many years, always said that if you put the word social in front of something, it negated the meaning of the word that followed. So just to say that if you... He would say that if you... Like, the word social democrat would mean that, you know... you. <laughs> Um, you, you neither believed in democracy nor the social. Um, obviously, social justice was, is a very interesting one. So social infrastructure, what, what do we mean? I think we mean a kind of grief lament about the desolation and evisceration of society. That's what I think we're talking about. And I think Imogen is really onto something when she talks about family, when she talks about... Uh, community um, 
And actually, it's interesting there, you know, the, these are areas, Imogen, when you said, you know, that we're at our best when we are caring and we're at our best when we're creative, I would say that we're also at our best when we're covenantal. That means that when we're thinking through the generations, let's give some meaning to that, that when we're thinking in intergenerational terms. And that doesn't mean just thinking about the future. That also means engaging with our inheritance. You know, I, I've drove, driven a bit potty with this concept of social capital. Because what is, it's like social infrastructure, you know, what is social capital? Social capital is actually what we inherit in terms of loving relationships and what we inherit in terms of what we have learned um, and understood. So then we have to recognize um, that when we're dealing with politics, we're dealing with matters of power. And um, what are the powers? And I just want to go back. It's, a, it's good. It's 20 past 7, so I think I can use a really horrible word, um, which is the tendency that capitalism has to commodify. That means turn things... I mean, commodification is not the sort of word. It's, it's a bit like social infrastructure. You use it around a family table and people look at you like you're nuts. But it's a very real thing. So what we've, what we've had is this, is, is this disintegration of the civic institutions. So it's a very interesting um, thing. So what, what, needs, what needs to happen is to create these spaces locally. This is the point. So capitalism and the state are very bad with place because they both seek universal procedures that are either efficient or just. That's the central dilemma. And, and what we need to do is resist the relentless pressure to centralize and the relentless pressure to commodify, which on the whole means that the institutions are removed and rationalized. So this is, what I'm saying is, um, Imogen, it's quite a radical step, this step that you're making. And the problem is obviously, I would say, with the big society was that they'd never dealt with the demonic power of capital to disintegrate relationships, to incentivize individualism. And um, that these are the realities that people confront when they're trying to live, to move away from the places that they were born, to earn more money, to have greater experience. How do we actually renew and resacralize these desecrated places is, I think, absolutely central to the covenant. And what it requires us to do, I think, is, is to think very differently about, about politics. And what politics is fundamentally about is giving power to local people to hold their rulers accountable. I mean, I'm sitting here in front of this Rainsborough quote. It's quite moving for me. I mean, that was what it was about in 1647, that the, that the poorest he, and we could say the poorest person, should have a life as significant as the greatest or the, or the richest person. Um, so this is the really fundamental change, I think, Imogen, in relation to this concept of covenant is that it will be a very, I mean, you wrote that thing with trust the people. If we push that, it means people actually having some assets and power, and that's got to mean a redistribution of resources, uh, Ruth, to places. So the two I mentioned that were really significant is recognizing that places have been depleted of assets and capital. So the endowment of regional banks that can only lend and function within the area they're in. And then these vocational colleges that will, that will say that, so for example, infrastructure projects, in my analysis, have been overwhelmingly based on doing things in places, bringing in contracted labor. You bring labor in from outside. How about that all of that has to deal with local labor and the cost of training the local labor the other aspect is corporate governance. It's having the representation of place and workers in the decision-making of firms so that they can't just move the firms out of those places. In other words, to socialize or to reappropriate capital as an inheritance and a dispossession. 
Um, Ma Morris, I'm just go I'm going to come to you in just a, a, a second, Imogen, but um, just to pick up on a few points. Relationships have come out really, really strongly in each contribution so far, and yet all the policy proposals seem to be about physical things, about infrastructure, and about participation and decision-making. Do you think that those things help create better and stronger relationships? Is there a sort of natural synergy between them? Or is it about not breaking down pre-existing relationships that you're really trying to sort of make sure that government policy doesn't get in the way of relationships rather than building them? Oh, so, so that's the central thing. So that's, let's go back to contract covenant. If you just exchange something with another person, you know, an exchange between hands, that's no relationship. Covenant is this framework. So to put it very simply, there's three kinds of power to talk about politics. Um, there's money power, which we can all understand. That's the ability to buy resources, buy people, and pursue your ends through, through um, money. Then there's state power, which we understand as a coercive power. So ultimately, Ruth, the only other alternative, which is sometimes called democracy, is a relational power. The, re the power that people have by associating together. So, as a, so all the incentives within this are the necessity of people building relationships together, but they're public. These are public relationships, but to renew relationships is the absolutely central part of this. And through that, you get a politics of, of grace somehow, where, where you can negotiate with others, endure disagreements, build coalitions, that's the essential thing that's going on. So Imogen, is that how you're thinking about relationship? And do you think the state can actually nurture strong social bonds and relationships between people at community level? Yes, I do. There's so much, uh, Morris, and what you said there, and um, I've got lots of notes here, and I'll try and weave my way through them and answer your question, Ruth. Um, I, um, I'm glad you think it's radical. I, th I think it is radical. Um, Navarra Media, if that means anything to anyone uh, in the audience, also think it's radical, which I take as a compliment. And Roger Scruton, I think, also had an issue with um, uh, people sticking social in front of everything. He, he also wasn't um, quite sure about it, I seem to remember. And I feel um, your pain, Morris. I think lots of um, policy makers um, get very um, self-conscious about needing to, basically needing to use utilitarian language. Um, so what is social infrastructure? I mean, I, I use it day to day, but it's, it's weird that we think social infrastructure would make more sense than parks, pubs, libraries, youth clubs. Um, that makes more sense than social infrastructure. But for some reason, uh, we feel the need to serve, um, serve procedures um, and measure everything. And that, that in one sense, is, is, is part of the problem here, I think. Um, so um, again, when I was doing some think tank work, just the, pre the pressure to measure everything all the time. And of course, it's important if government's going to be sensible with um, how it raises taxes, spends money. Um, we need to measure things and, and know that the um, you know outcomes are good um, because it's not for some reason it's not it's not good enough um, for 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 something to be good. It's got to be proven to boost education or employment outcomes um, uh, rather than uh, rather than a more, a more instinctive sense of what is good. Um, and, and that I hope some of the covenantal language can start giving confidence to policymakers to just start talking about what's good and what's commonly held as, as good. Um, and where was I going? Ruth, your question about the state's role in nurturing those, um, those relationships. I mean, um, I think, I suppose, I, I suppose personally, I'm sort of unapologetic about my belief that the state, um, the government should have a substantive vision of the good life. Um, and to encourage that in the lives of families, um, communities, and the nation. Um, and I think that that is done by um, th all the things that, that Caroline mentioned, um, devolving power, which also means devolving budgets um, down to local authorities, out to communities. Um, and that, that was a big thrust of, of our report, um, trust the people. Um, we should trust the people um, with more power, we should trust the people with 
money um, and see what they do with that. And that, that's going to be risky, but it's also um, creative and lots of um, people know what they would do with that power, what they would do with that money. And I think um, for lots of them, it would be um, serving the relationships that they hold dear to them. So, so one of the things when I was in government that um, was always pushed back against the sort of notion of devolving power down to the local level is that you'd get a postcode lottery of services which emerged because people would naturally make different choices between different parts of the country. Is that something in your vision that you're prepared, we, you think we should just live with as a consequence of a much fuller participatory system? That's a difficult question. Um, in, a, in a sense, in a sense, yes, I do. Um, I think if you're devolving power, devolving budgets um, to people, then they will. Ha when that goes wrong, um, when they don't like the results, um, they have, you know, the power to, to do something about that. So, in, in a sense, I suppose my answer is uh, yes. There, there's there's that risk there. Um, but if the if the power is in is in the hands of the people, I think that's no bad thing. A very short contribution from Morris and Caroline before we go on to the next stage. Right. Um, well, um, I just want to respond to some of those points. Um, perhaps I should uh, speak on behalf of social infrastructure, uh, first of all. <laughs> uh, I spent nine years in the Treasury. And, um, you know, I was at the heart of the machine that was, you know, implementing this managerial model of how government works, pulling the levers in the treasury, setting the targets, and um, then getting things delivered. And, uh, but I also know about money as a consequence of my experience, and it's very hard to get the government to invest in things. So, you know, there's a kind of machinery around capital investment. And I think the value of talking about social infrastructure is that it's putting it on a par. Uh, I think it's also, you know, you have to name things. I, I agree, it's perhaps not the best name. You know, I, I love talking about a good place because I think that people recognize a good place the minute they see one, you know. Um, it, it, it means something to them. But uh, if, if something doesn't have a name, then it's easy for the, the family silver to be sold off. And what we've seen over the last uh, you know, 10 years or so is an awful lot of social infrastructure being disinvested in order to fund short-term priorities and because of the shortage of overall money. And no arguments being put forward to invest in it. So I'm sticking with social infrastructure. I think it's language that the investors um, in our economy will recognize. Um, but if you can come up with a better word or phrase, go for it. I mean, good place, as I say, has a place in my heart too. Um, the big society, I wrote five reports about what was wrong with the big society. Um, and so I sort of feel that I could sort of almost have a PhD in this subject. But I think, it, it, you know, the demonic power of capital is, is undoubtedly, I'm sure, part of it, uh, Morris, but, um, it's also about that operating model. You know, a government that doesn't know how to do it, doesn't even know what it's talking about, I think, uh, has an instinct that there's something bigger between, as David Cameron puts it, between the market and the state, um, but really doesn't know how to create it. And I would say that investing in social infrastructure and letting people get on with making the connections that create social capital in their own way is a good way to do that. Um, but also not setting targets, I'd agree with Imogen, um, uh, you know, and, and thinking about the longer term. And then um, relationships. Um, oh, I just want to say one other thing, which is I think that we, the other thing that's invisible about social infrastructure, but it's sort of implicit in the levelling up debate, is that uh, we have a massive problem with civic inequality in this country. Some places, just go to Richmond, where my daughter happens to be living at the moment, you know, it's looking pretty good. You know, go to a place, you know, on the East Coast, which has been disinvested in for decades. It looks totally different, you know, and some of this is, is quite philosophical, I dare say, but some of it is really very practical indeed. Civic inequality needs to come onto our radar. And postcode lottery, well, um, I think universal services are a critical part of this. You can have standards, you can have funding that allows everybody to have access to equal services, but you can still work in communities and you can still get those services to build relationships, not just do to, but do with. Quick, quick comment from Morris. Two quick comments. 
um, you know, the, the first really is, is Imogen is to talk about how beautiful and brilliant, um, if we could get into it, Catholic social thought is. Because I also found this with, with postcode lotteries. Any, any deviation from universal procedure is considered a surrender to. But what are they saying? They're saying, that what are you going to do here? Eliminate place. I mean, that's the logic of where they go. Move, go. Um, and that's the nature of the dispossession. So if you look at those two components, uh, Imogen of Catholic social thought, which is subsidiarity and solidarity. Solidarity means that there's a redistribution from rich to poor. So you could say that the poorer the area, the higher the endowment of the local bank. You could say that the lower the um, wages and the, and the poorer the workforce, the greater the investment in the vocational colleges. Do you see how that works together? But the idea is we want to renew place, not abolish it. And that whole thing I found really totalitarian, the whole thing about the postcode lottery, because it because the logic of it was don't live there. You, you lot, you left behind, move to where there's a better postcode. But what's amazing and should be noted is that people don't feel that way. And the second really, really quick point about um, all of this and about endowment is that Rainsborough and all of this, just think about the last time we had a really big thing, which was the Reformation and, and all of that. One of the incredible things they did was not only the endowment of schools and grammar schools and universities, it wasn't a centralized state operation, but the big thing they did, and it took 70 years, was the translation of the Bible. And this translation of the Bible completely transformed our, our culture, the King James Bible. And there was no way that the poorest he and the greatest he could even have been uttered without the incredible effect of that Bible translation on our political culture. So that's also a covenantal thing about long-term investment in goods. Thank, th thanks, Morris. I'm going to suggest something completely random. Okay, uh, show of hands, anybody? Right. Well, I have one here on the front, so I'll take, I think Marianne is going round with, um, with a mic for your questions. Thank so you very we'll much. We'll take maybe a couple together. Yeah. My name is Richard Harris. I'm a social action network. Also, for the purposes of my question, uh, a former civil servant. Um, thank you very much to the speakers for the presentations. They were all very interesting. And you saw everyone, particularly me, nodding along as you were making your points. They were all very good points. People nodded in particular, I noticed, when you were talking about the need for devolution. Uh, what I didn't hear tonight was anything about how we actually really achieve devolution. I also, by the way, didn't hear much about the devolved administrations, combined authorities. We talked briefly about local authorities, but um, there was those throwaway remarks that council tax and business rates will, will do for them. Having been in that bit of government that dealt with council tax and business rates, I, I stifled the, the guffaw that I had in my mouth at that point, because it is quite tough, um, that financial regime. So my question is this. As a civil servant, I observed that we have more than 100 MPs of the governing party on the payroll vote in one way or another in this country, just for the UK government. Germany has half that number, France has half that number. Why do we need so many and is that part of the problem? Uh, it, would we do better if we had fewer MPs? Okay, th thanks for that question. I'm sure people will have a lot to say on that subject, but if we could take one more perhaps uh, from the back there. Thank you. Uh, my name's Ian, and you've got me thinking about participation and asking myself whether there needs to be, as it were, a compensatory bias. So, my question is this. What strategies can the government develop to facilitate the active participation of those who are on the periphery of society? That's my question, and, my, and the context out of which I'm asking it is I'm thinking of the many homeless people particularly whom I encounter in Bournemouth, where I'm the Church of England's rector, and I'm keen that ways be found to enable them to become participant contributors rather than outsiders. 
Oh, okay, thank, thanks for that. With a lot of substance in those two questions. So I'm going to try and ask the panellists to keep their comments as brief as they can while doing justice to the questions. So we managed to get some, some more in. I think it's probably these are subjects that each of you will want to say something on. Morris, I know that you um, have thought quite a lot about compensatory bias, for instance. So maybe you'd like to start. Sure. Um, good to meet you, um, Ian. Um, two thoughts in relation um, to that. The, the, the first one is, you know, politics in between elections. What is it? And this kind of relates to what you were saying, Richard. So my experience of local government is that they're fundamentally administrative accounting and delivery units. It's, it's desolate. It's, it's terrible. Um, so th that's what I mean. If there was genuine assets, this redistribution of assets, and obviously I've got my thoughts about um, Ruth, what we were saying earlier about the postcode lottery. Um, this, is, this is between me and Ruth, something I think Ruth will understand. Do you remember when John Crudder was asked to do the 2004 so, where we were, we were called in, John and I, into, into the leader's office. Two minutes. They say, we'd like you to do the manifesto, but don't do the economy, don't do foreign policy, don't do welfare reform. So we didn't quite know <laughs> what, what we were supposed to do. So what we used was the small resources we had, we asked where people lived. And just to say that people really described themselves, this was overwhelming, according to the 1534 parish map, rather than the present one. They actually said that they were from this place, in this county, often the counties didn't exist. In political terms, no one said they were from Medway. No one said that they were from Humberside. No one said any of this North Lincolnshire. They said they were from Lincoln, they were from Lancashire. Even Alison Merseyside, they said they were from Lancashire. It was overwhelming that the existence of the affections of place. So we've got to work, what I'm saying is, uh, we've got to work within that, but to go back very quickly, sorry for that brief anecdote, in the concept that in Rome they had these tribunes, only the plebs could be part of it, i.e. you couldn't belong to the tribune um, unless you were propertyless, essentially. And what they were were accountability assemblies where you could uh, sack local people for corruption or inefficiency. I think we've got to think very creatively about what you're saying. So when it comes to housing, how about we establish local tribunes made up of people who don't own property or people who are homeless, and they actually hold the people in charge of, of housing policy accountable. I mean, that's just one example um, of what it means where there's interests, where there's genuine interests. I mean, we, we can all remember what happened with Stoke Mandeville Hospital. And all, there's no accountability, all these decisions. Who's the, head, who's the head teacher? Who's the head of the hospital? These should be public assembly matters where they're, where they're decided by vote uh, among the people. And I just want to say that in terms of your question, so I tried to deal with the substance of the thing about renewing uh, place. But in terms of what you said about the MPs, this is just a whipping matter, you know, on, on the whole, I think. Um, Caroline, you've had a lot of practical experience of thinking about participation. Yes. Um, well, I mean, this is something that this, uh, this issue of participation that is much discussed in a better way. And um, we have a, a group that is looking at um, listening, what we call radical listening. And um, that means really um, listening with an open heart and an open agenda um, to people and their experiences and giving them, through that process, much more power to influence the agenda. Because often when we're consulted, and of course often they're not consulted, but when they are consulted, they're consulted with a, you know, with a pretty much um, clear agenda about what the local authority is going to do or whatever. So um, this process of active uh, radical listening is, is critical, but we've also talked about um, bringing the communities that you serve into the organization, into the governance of the organization, and into the policy-making structures. And um, this is, I think, incredibly important. 
and it, you know, it can apply to voluntary groups, but it can also apply to government, and uh, you know, certainly to sort of public services. So I think that's really important. And one of the um, things we were talking about just the other week, actually, was uh, something that Homeless Link, I don't know if you've come across them, they're a group uh, that works with homeless people, and they basically provide peer support, people who were homeless, provide support to people who are homeless to help them get health services. But they also use um, people who you know, were homeless or are homeless to do research. And they go out onto the streets and actually talk to people that wouldn't otherwise be very easy to find, or if you could find them, probably wouldn't open up because they, they don't trust the people who are trying to talk to them. They don't trust them, they don't think that they understand them. So that's another kind of form of, of, of radical listening. And then another, which we've discussed related to that, is bringing in what we call citizen scientists into research. People who uh, live in a community, who have experience of that community, who uh, you know, have a little bit of training and to avoid you know, bias and things like that, but go out into the community to have open conversations with people and bring that information back to shape the future of the public services or whatever it might be, or public policy. And I think bringing people into decision-making and grants is also a very important thing. And places like Barking and Dagenham are doing that. Um, they've got an endowment fund and they're bringing in um, people with lived experience to help make decisions as to who gets the grants. Again, it's the control of the money, giving the power away. And, and, and Caroline, just on the question of MPs, could they be radical listeners too, or do we just have too many? Well, I think at best, actually, MPs are radical listeners. You know, I think let's be fair to them. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just as ready as anyone else to bash uh, certain MPs. But, you know, the open surgeries that they have, listening to cases, it, you know, that's a very, very important part of our democracy. And that's why we have um, MPs who are elected by a place rather than uh, other forms of, uh, uh, you know, electoral processes. And I think that that can be very important. I think one of the things, you know, it's very topical, but I just want to say it um, because it's also true, that, you know, you've got to think, who, is, who are they really listening to? Who's paying them ex that extra money uh, that sometimes they're earning? You know, are they really listening to the people that they serve? Or are they actually looking to the interests of money, big money, often? Well, I've, I've got a certain soft spot for MPs myself, but you'll <laughs> forgive me, you'll forgive me that. Um, Imogen, devolution um, and participation. How important is participation at the local level and at what level to your vision? Thanks, Ruth. Just to second what Caroline was saying about MPs who uh, have, I've worked for a few of them, and um, they are often told that they're very disconnected from Westminster and yada, yada, yada. And some of them are, there, of course, there are a few bad apples, but like Caroline said, they do spend, they're supposed to, and many of them do spend every Friday and then the weekend, Monday morning, before they head to Parliament on Monday afternoon um, in their constituencies doing surgeries. Um, and certainly the, the MPs that I've worked for and with um, are, of that, are of that ilk. Um, so there's a shout out to all the MPs that spend their Fridays in their constituency uh, listening. Um, on Richard's question of um, devolution, often in our office we talk about devolving down to local authorities and out to communities. Some people call it kind of double devolution. And um, some local authorities are really good at that and others aren't. So I suppose a stellar example is um, Wigan Council, who um, when austerity um, uh, began, I suppose, in 2010, um, the chief executive there, Donna Hall, decided that she was not going to just start salami slicing her services, but actually she was going to um, call on uh, local people to work with the council and actually work with the council, the council working with the communities rather than the kind of big society, let's just dump them some responsibility on volunteers. Um, and it worked brilliantly, so things like community asset ownership, um, Wigan Council worked really hard to enable and facilitate the community to take over the ownership of local assets such as swimming pools. And um, all the um, evaluations, um, you know, um, testified to the fact that it was a great success. And not all local authorities are like Wigan, but um, I've, we're kind of um, cooking up a, a policy proposal in our office at the moment to try and encourage local authorities to be more Wigan. Um, so um, community covenants um, is something that, that sort of um, 
um, being being tossed around at the moment. Can we can we can we help local authorities to ensure um, that they they are they enter into a covenant with their community and that they're properly serving um, their communities? And um, to the point about consultation, um, when I was doing some research in in deprived areas, Birkenhead, Clacton, the Rhondda Valley, time and time again, local people were just so furious at these sham sham consultations and they felt cheated, you know, speaking to people at a care home who said, well, the officials came in during our lunch break. You know, of course I wasn't going to give them uh, the, 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 the time to answer all their questions because we were busy. And um, uh, it's a, yeah, again, it's, it's a great shame. Um, and just a final point on, on participation, Again, when I was doing this um, research in, in, in these areas, there was a, so many local um, churches and other faith organisations were involved in, uh, they, they would call it outreach. And I think particularly the Church of England has this amazing um, uh, s structure, this amazing model. You know, you, every, every person is a, mem is a parishioner, is a member of a parish, whether they know it or whether they like it, they are. And I just think that's, that's kind of cool, really. Um, we're, all, we're all parishioners of our parish. We might not know it, might not like it, but, but there are these buildings um, scattered across, across the UK, and not all of them, but some of them are doing some really amazing work, just keeping their doors open. And they are the little platoons or the mediatory institutions which the local welfare officials, the DDP you know, in the local places, need to be going to those places. We often talk about the co-location of, of services. Um, people need to engage with, their, with DDP officials how wonderful if they can find them in their local church or in their local post office. And I just think oh, there, are, there are lots of, I mean, these aren't difficult things to do. There are lots of things we can do to, to enable um, better participation among, among um, the most vulnerable and disadvantaged. And finally, um, housing. Um, some of, the, some of the housing that the most vulnerable and disadvantaged people live in is just not, um, it's just not fit for participatory reciprocal um, engagement and frankly community life you know no green spaces no public spaces or if there are public spaces they're not well cared for and places that you wouldn't want to hang out so again I think we need to we need to think about planning and how can that be covered how can it how can we plan covenantally and, and ensure that all our buildings particularly housing um, have those meeting places that are attractive and people want to go to Thank you. Now, we had a couple of questions back here. So if I take, um, yes, this gentleman there, and then the person at the very back. David Campanale, trade unionist. In the 1647 debate here in Putney, Henry Ireton, the son-in-law of, of uh, Oliver Cromwell, said that the great foundation of justice is that we keep covenant with one another. And he made that point because, of course, the parliamentarians felt that there had been a deep breach of covenant by the king, and we know how that ended up. Just five miles down the river from here at Kingston was where, right from the earliest times, the crown the, was placed on the head of the kings in the Saxon era. And the words read out from the first book of Kings about an obligation that was made by Jehoiada on a covenant between the king and the people, the people and the king, the God, God and king, and the people. There was a tripartite relationship. And can I ask for the reflections of the panel about what they feel might be the means of renewal of that tripartite relationship? Um, Morris has commented on the centrality of the Bible to that idea of covenant. And I just wonder what steps to renewal the panel might think uh, are open to us if we are to restore what Ayrton called that deep sense of justice. Thank you. And just at the back. Um, Heather Buckingham from the Trussell Trust. Um, as some of you know, uh, we support a network of food banks across the UK, and last year they gave out uh, two and a half million emergency food parcels, and we know that 95% of the people receiving those parcels meet the criteria for destitution, so they don't have enough money to afford the essentials. 
Um, and one of the things I think that makes apparent is that um, nation and community are goods to very differing extents for different people at the moment, um, which we've heard a bit about through um, some of the observations about civic inequality. Um, what I'd like to ask the panel is, kind of where does equality fit within the common good? And to what extent um, do you think that securing a standard of living uh, where everyone has enough to afford the essentials is a prerequisite to some of the kinds of relational and participatory work that we've been talking about this evening? Or do you think that this kind of approach to community and to government can drive the kind of social change that would be needed to make that the case? Thanks. Thank you very much to very meaty questions. Um, Panellists, don't feel obliged to take both of them. Uh, you may want to choose one to focus on. Uh, Morris, can I start with you? Thanks. OK, um, so I'm going to try and c combine them in some way, um, David and Heather. It, it's a neglected aspect of covenant that, that I'd really forgotten until... So when lockdown comes, I'm just going to make a public confession. I've never really read the Bible. You know, I, I, so I, I gave it as my lockdown mission, Heather, to read the, to actually read, well, in my case, this was the, as you can imagine, it was the Old Testament, you know, that I was, I was reading. And what astonished me with Covenant were, were three things. Uh, the first was land reform. So, essentially, every 49 years, the land was restored to its original owners. And that opened up a whole space for me to think about dispossession, enclosures, what, you know, what the distribution of property, but it wasn't distributed to the state. The, the, the land wasn't centralized. The land was radically decentralized and the large estates were broken up. So the first thing uh, to say, Heather, is, is that the concept of land reform, I think, is absolutely central, that, that every citizen should be distributed land, and that would be a fundamental aspect of autonomy. The second is debt relief. It really took me aback that every seven years all debts were annulled. And I think that now we're looking to a period where the issue of debt and then, um, Caroline, it's not just civic inequality, it's financial inequality, you know, the centralizations of wealth can be addressed again in a way that underwrites the autonomy of families, the, the possibility of living um, a, meaning, a meaningful life. And, and these are, you know, David, these are the issues that Covenant, what I realized was is that Covenant was a way of breaking up the inequalities that emerge from over time in markets, uh, that they also were a way in which people could re-covenant, you know, that was the whole thing, the seven years, the jubilee, the 49 years, was a process to, of re-covenanting. And in, and in that sense, David, you know, in terms of, you, you raised the issue with the church, the, the way that the church has been just selling off its churches rather than re-covenanting with the local area, I think this is vital Imogen for, for the future of the work, is, it's not clear to me that the land that the church has is even legally theirs to sell because they never bought it. It was endowed to them. <laughs> and so we can really think creatively here about the reconstitution of the commons, of the, of the common life. I could go on, but I'll leave it there. No, th thanks. And um, um, Caroline, equality. How important is that to your vision? I think it uh, runs absolutely right through. I think it's, it's incredibly important. You know, our vision of a society is one that's inclusive and um, fair and equal. Um, and diversity is recognised and respected. I think that um, inequality, or rather equality, has to be part of that um, covenant between, to put it in your terms, God, King and the people, uh, looking back um, to the past, but now between the people and the state. And um, you have to believe that the government is working on behalf of the people. 
uh, working on behalf of their interests and doing that equally, sharing the resources of society equally. And, um, you know, successive governments have talked about equality and fairness and opportunity for all, but the fact is that if you look at our society, that's not the case. You know, this is not where we are. You know, the governments that we've had have not delivered that equality and fairness in society. And that's why I think that the better way is actually truly radical, because I think when we start talking about sharing and building power, listening to each other, particularly those least heard, joining forces because most problems are too complex to solve alone and putting relationships first in society and in everything that we do and in our services. If you actually did all of those things, if you really were genuinely listening to people, if you really were genuinely sharing power, if you really were thinking about trust and relationships at every level of society, including in high politics, um, if you really were joining forces, you know, we wouldn't be having the, some of the stuff that's going on in Parliament half the time not addressing social care issues, for example, not addressing global warming, not thinking about the longer term, thinking about electoral advantage. You know, it's about um, who you serve and whether you feel that the government is actually working for everyone in society. That is the common good. And that's the standard that needs to be applied. And I think you can get very kind of, um, you know, obviously there are deep thinkers here about this in this room, and I'm not one of them, but I think it's not rocket science. Thanks, um, Caroline. And I Imogen, we've had um, talk of God, King, and the people. We're sitting here in St. Mary's Church in, in Putney, site of the Putney debates. There's Morris's work that draws explicitly on Catholic social teaching. How important is religion in um, your understanding of the covenant, or is it not explicitly a religious vision? I'm really glad you asked me that, Ruth. Um, I don't know if you saw the, the notes I've been scribbling, but I, yes, I'll, in a roundabout way, get to um, the question. Um, I don't think that the new social covenant is explicitly religious. However, I do believe in a, um, I suppose I would call it a sacred order, or in fact, I wouldn't call it a sacred order, Philip Reef, um, who is my favourite um, intellectual at the moment, um, um, uh, the late Philip Reef. Um, talked about a, a, a sacred order and he says that it's impossible for society to function without a registration of a, of a, of a sacred order and um, justice is when we keep covenant with with one another um, I my belief is that the individual and the state are best connected when the when the family, the community nation these little platoons these mediatory institutions are connected and, and joined up um, and I think that God is a creator God and he created this world and there is a created order. And um, Philip, Philip Reef's sort of main thesis, I suppose, um, is that there's the human flourishing and a, and a healthy society occurs um, when there's alignment between the sacred order and the social order. And um, this is getting very theological here, um, but track, bear with me. Um, and I and I believe that uh, that actually um, there are there are common goods that have been that have been ordained um, by good that we by God that we find in the family that we find in the community and that we find um, in uh, an understanding of, of the nation. And it's no surprise that humans flourish um, when they are when they are covenantally involved in, in these fundamental tiers of association. Um, so that, that's, I suppose, um, my personal uh, reflection on, on whether this is or isn't explicitly uh, religious. Um, I don't think the New Social Covenant is explicitly religious, but I, I certainly think, in my personal opinion, um, that, there is, there is a, that there is a sacred order and that society would do well to live by that. By that. Thank you very much. Um, time for... A, I'm going to take three questions over here to round it off, and I'm going to ask... Responders, to be very brief indeed, Derek. Thanks. Um, um, I'd like to pick up on this theme that's come out, the, the relationship between the sort of radical politics of the Civil War period and, and perhaps the contemporary, and particularly about um, uh, faith and uh, the state and politics. Um, Alistair Campbell famously once said of the new Labour election winning machine, we don't do God. Um, I was reminded of Cromwell's famous phrase, not so famous phrase, actually about 
after he won the Battle of Master Moor, and he was asked to account for it in the sort of post-match interview. And he said, the Lord of Hosts made, us, made them as but stubble to our swords. In other words, Cromwell very much did do God. And it seems to me that since Cromwell's time, the language of faith, and particularly the language of Christianity, has become completely drained from political discourse. And I wondered whether any of you think that it may ever return, whether any politician would have the courage to uh, perhaps espouse their Christian or any other faith. And if it did, whether you think that would be a good thing in terms of achieving the sort of outcomes that you've, you've alluded to tonight. Hey, thank you. And Joanna and Philip at the back, please. Yes, uh, Joanna Bogle. Um, Covenant. The missing bit, seems to me, is the original covenant was marriage. And it's the one thing that's very difficult to mention now. And if you do mention it, somebody usually says, well, you know, marriage can be anything like a threesome or something. So I think we ought to be allowed to mention marriage. When the lamb was redistributed in the Bible, it wasn't given to individuals. It was given to families. And the bit we, we miss out on is that covenant uh, between man and wife and then with their children. And that's bigger than just man and wife. Um, in the experience of many of us working with families who have been difficulties, and I'm thinking of girls at food banks, and the money isn't there, but it's gone on the nail bars and the tattoos and stuff. But there isn't a covenant. But they're not a they, they're a we, we're a community. It's also the experience of many of us that sometimes people who haven't made a very successful, let's say, marriage or equivalent, are very effective as grandparents. So unless we emphasise marriage, we're not going to get any into generational stuff, and that's a covenant too. So there has to be a sense of belonging marrying between parents and children and grandparents, and that is also something that affects people of every social category, because sometimes people lose out on things, even though they're actually quite well off, including a home, because of the breakup of a marriage. And the, the movement to a park bench actually can happen to somebody who from the sort of financial point of view, was quite well off. And they're still homeless. People I've served breakfast to who are in that position. So the covenant of marriage is much, much more important than we think. Thanks. And um, Philip's got the last question there. Um, thanks. I, I really want to ask about healthcare uh, provision in the UK, which is knocking on for 10% of national income. So it's a big issue. So in, in Britain, there's um, almost no market. There's absolutely no society. There's no local government. There is only really central government provision of, uh, of, of healthcare. And this contrasts with almost every other continent, sorry, almost every continental European country. So in Germany, um, the, the, the government owns about 40% of hospitals and 60% are owned either by the church, mutual associations, or the private sector. It, in Holland, about 100% of hospitals are owned, in fact, by uh, mutual associations, charities, or the private sector. In social democratic France, if I could use that phrase, Morris, um, uh, over 50% of hospitals are owned by mutual associations or the private sector. Um, no, if, if we're going to... Um, uh, uh, deal with this question of things being divided only between a centralised state and the market, don't we have to look at the way we provide healthcare in this country? Okay, um, very challenging questions. Um, Imogen, do you want to pick up on the point about faith uh, first? Because you've just been talking about how your own view is quite explicitly grounded in a sense of the sacred. Is this something that you think could ever be politically palatable to bring back faith into public discourse. And then, if you want to pick up on the healthcare point, feel free. Can I, can I choose faith and marriage? And marriage. OK. <laughs> um, on the faith point, um, lots. I think overarching problem is, I suppose, a religious illiteracy um, which exists across society and, I think, in the House of Commons as well. Though there are MPs, there are MPs of faith, and there are MPs of faith who... Do if you th if you if I think back to some of the main speeches of 2019, um, MPs who are unapologetic on unapologetic about their faith and how that how that will impact um, the policy proposals and, and and the speeches that they that they make in Parliament, um, and and I think a lot the MPs that that I kind of have in mind, I suppose they 
they believe that this this idea that um, one is neutral and has no faith, has no particular persuasion towards any kind of ideology is um, rubbish. Um, and I think um, there are some MPs that are feel, yeah feel confident to sort of pick, to sort of pick up on that point and um, and you know genuinely try and persuade their colleagues of their world view we all have world views they think they've got the best one the right one um and you know it's and i think it has been good to see some of that um play out in in the house of commons over recent um uh weeks months um on marriage um the new social covenant unit is um an apologetic about about marriage and i go back to the point i made earlier about it. it's very difficult to just say something's good for the sake of it being good we've, all, we've always got to measure it and prove it but it's there the evidence is there um the center for social justice for instance has done a whole heap of research on marriage and how it's good um as you say um for families for communities and for society in general and it absolutely is about keeping covenant with future generations um it, we know it's good for children um and yeah and i and i'd love to see more um policy makers um sort of um being brave and speaking up for marriage uh, thanks i was actually quite struck um, myself during the comments that family and marriage haven't been mentioned much uh, from the platform if at all um but but carol do you want to pick up on on those points well um religion um i think that uh, you know, there have been um, many prominent pol politicians who've had faith. You know, uh, I worked directly for Margaret Thatcher for a while, and she was certainly a devout Christian. And Tony Blair, um, obviously, as well, and doubtless many others. But the, the, the fact is that in our society, we have many faiths, um, and people of no faith. And the um, looking at the definition of common good it's about um, creating a society where everyone can flourish and where um, there's a settled pluralism of identities and interests and i think what i would make a plea for is not to you know i think there's nothing wrong with people having faith obviously and um professing that but i think in the, the realm of politics and the realm of delivery of public services and um communities I'd like to hear more talk about the importance of things, our common humanity. I mean, I think one of the things that's come out of the Better Way Network for me as an ex-Treasury official, um, you know, I was quite, it was quite a revelation in a way to, to realize the power of our common humanity. We vastly underestimate the power of our humanity, kindness, love. These are words that's almost embarrassing to talk about in the context of policy. And they do actually, they're quite ecumenical, they go across religions. And I think that you know, we need to talk more about being human and be human together. And um, so I think that's the kind of common ground which will allow people to, you know, with different um, faiths and, and views, to, you know, find a com common place, uh, a common good. And there's just too little of it in how we work together. I mean, for example, you know, just look at politics for a start. Um, not much obvious evidence of that. But um, when it comes down to the delivery of public services, you know, people, professionals are often taught really to put their humanity at the door and, and maintain professional standards. And I think we just need to bring humanity and the importance of relationships and, into everything that we do. I think marriage... Um, and the bonds that people form are very important, but you know there are many forms of marriage in our current society. I know it's controversial for some people, but you know I, I personally think that we should encourage bonds um, between people, however they choose to form them. Well, if there's one subject that's even more difficult to talk about in political life than, than marriage, it's the NHS, uh, Caroline. <laughs> um. Well, that, and, and that's why I'm avoiding it. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave that I'll one, leave to Morris. one to Morris. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so first of all, you know, so politics involves collective coercive power. It, it, I just want to go um, back to this. So there's, and, and to go back to the Civil War, you know, um, you know, people in in England became rightfully averse to enthusiasms and to violence. I mean, ultimately, political sovereignty is a matter of violence, the capacity to impose. So, 
But what is absolutely necessary to me is, uh, so what you have in politics is this schizophrenia. On the one hand, it's about, which Ruth is really aware of, it's about admin, it's about efficiency, it's about delivery. And on the other hand, it's about the primary matter of the meaning of life and who we are, you know, and the, these, these sit uneasily. Um, so what I, what I do think, I'm just responding initially here to the first question, is two absolutely necessary things is that you are free, we are free to expound our vision of the kingdom and what that means. But we are bound by the persuasion and consent of our fellow citizens in, the, in that regard. So what, is, what I'm saying to you is, I don't hear enough at all about a Christian vision of what our society should be. And so it's not present in the negotiations of Politics, and I, I would say in relation to what Caroline said, is that faithfulness, compassion, mercy, righteousness, sacrifice, kindness, and love, none of those were really present in Greek or Roman politics. These are Christian virtues in many ways that formed the notion of the human as, as, as a person capable of love and grace, or, or, or what Imogen would say, care and creativity. That, that, and that these were bound in relationships and, and, and in relation, David, to, to, to covenant. So what's necessary is, is to be able to, to begin to articulate a vision of what our country should be. I'm always aware that this has to be done through persuasion and not through coercion. So th th this speaks, but what I would say fundamentally, is that this new era that we're in um, needs a rediscovery of the sacred. So, for example, if you look at Nietzsche, or if you look at transhumanism, if you look at a utilitarianism, it has a desiccated, soulless conception of the human being. And that must be rightfully opposed. You know, so, and what we hold to be sacred, I would say, and and my experience of politics is, is that this is possible, is to say that human beings and our natural environment are not commodities. They're a sacred inheritance that we're there to treasure and nurture. And we do that through relationship, we do that through trust. Um, that these, we're free to say it, we don't say it. And to, it's to have the strength to, to develop that kind of politics. Just wanted to get to the, the final thing there, and I'm in radical listening mode and, and in agreement, is, is just to respond very slightly to, to Philip's point about the sacred. So two things are sacred now in our society, the NHS and the Second World War. You know, don't mess with them. Um, they're held together, they bind us together. So what I've learned in politics is as soon as you begin to walk into a sphere where you can talk about a more relational NHS or a more local NHS, you violate many people's conception of the sacred. So one of Machiavelli said, you know, that the art of politics is to act in time. And maybe this is not the time for NHS reform, you know. <laughs> Brilliant, uh, Morris. Look, I'm going to ask each panellist in a maximum of 30 seconds to try and leave our audience with a final thought uh, this evening. So Imogen, if I could start with you. Easy, be less than 30 seconds. Um, I think I would say freedom is not the beginning and end of the good life, but covenants are. And the government, government would do well um, to strengthen the family, the community and the nation. Perfect, thank you. Caroline. Well, if it's going to be 30 seconds, I think I'm just going to have to return to my three points. You know, the, there's a role for the state, but it should decentralise. It should invest in a good place and make sure that civic inequalities are addressed so that everybody grows up and lives in a good place. And it should um, change how it works by building relationships, listening to everybody joining forces and sharing and building power. And I think equality is the, is, is the, is the ultimate goal, a society where we can all live together uh, with settled differences and a pluralism of views. And I think, you know, humanity is a critical guiding force here. Thank you. And Morris, a final thought to leave everyone with? 
I guess, I guess you know, tonight and, and, and listening and, and being part of this is to say that, that we need to renew a political sense of what is sacred in our inheritance in terms not only of human beings and nature. You know, I used to get in trouble in Labour Ruth. People used to attack me for working with churches and religious groups. And I used to say, well, at least they don't think that the free market created the world. You know, <laughs> and um, <coughs> that, there was, that there was something I inherited there. But it's also sitting here tonight, I just have to say the sacred inheritance of our liberty and our democracy need to be cared for in our covenant, our new covenantal, that we've been blessed with this inheritance, but we disregard it um, at, our, at our peril. Uh, th thank you so much, um, everybody. Uh, I think it's been a fun, fascinating discussion. You've been an absolutely brilliant audience. I look forward to seeing you afterwards. <laughs>